You're listening to The Peace Corner with a group of young, peace-hungry interns at GPAC, the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. In a world riddled with violent conflict, peace can feel elusive and peace building can sound abstract. We want to change that with The Peace Corner. Who are the people breaking away from the discourses of hate and violence and transforming the status quo? What personally drives these people to peace building? There are many stories of peace, some which inspire us, fill us with hope, and others which make us hungry for change. Each podcast, we talk to a different peace builder about their own personal experience in the field, from Nicaragua to Palestine and beyond. This is a chance to hear from the people putting themselves on the line for peace, the people who remain steadfast in their pursuit of more peaceful societies, and who incidentally are delightful to talk to. So nestle into a corner and listen to the voices making peace possible. Welcome to the Peace Corner. Today, your host is Charlotte. Shalom. Salam. I was born into a violent conflict on the side of the oppressor. Naturally, I was exposed to a very carefully constructed process of indoctrination. I lived the first 20 years of my life believing that Palestine and Palestinians were an anti-Semitic invention. At 20, fresh from enforced Israeli military service, a dear Palestinian friend humanized my so-called enemy and opened my eyes to the atrocities Israel commits in my name. At 26, I am an Israeli Jew, actively, vocally, and staunchly opposed to Israel's crimes against humanity. So for this peace corner, I decided to talk to Lucy Nusebe to hear from a peace-building pioneer living and working in one of the most pervasive and protracted oppressions in the world, the occupied Palestinian territories. Lucy has been living in the occupied Palestinian territories since 1978 and is the founder of Middle East Nonviolence and Democracy, MEND. So, Lucy, hello, welcome. Hello, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Um, how did you personally come to peace building? Well, I was married to a Palestinian living in uh, Jerusalem under the Israeli occupation there, and I was teaching in a university, Beer Zeit, in the West Bank, and it was impossible to live there and not want to do something to try to make things better. The occupation was everywhere. We were often stopped on our way to teaching, unable to get then to classes in time. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, there was uh, increasing resistance and there was the Intifada of 1987, which was very powerful, Mm -hmm. popular resistance to what was going on. And that had so much hope with it. But that hope, fairly soon after the Oslo Accords, which are now almost exactly 25 years old, fairly soon after that, on the Palestinian side, the hope began to fade because things weren't really rolling out as they should have done. After five years, there should have been an autonomous Palestinian state. And this wasn't happening. And there was a lot of hope. But things weren't going quite right. And it seemed important to to become more engaged. Teaching in a university was a lot of fun. It didn't feel as if it was doing enough. Mm -hmm. And so you spoke a little bit about the climate within which MEND was established. So 20 years on, how would you say that this climate has changed? In 1998, there was still a lot of hope. There was a lot of... Unity. There were different political factions, but people were really believing that Palestine could become a model democratic state in the region, that it would become, uh, you know, something where everyone could fulfill their potential and fulfill their hopes. And uh, now there is real despair. Mm. There's also social fragmentation. It's, uh, it's if, as much as could be the opposite of what it was then. People have become individualistic. They have no hope either at the individual or the political level. People don't even know what to hope for, mm. which is uh, part of the problem, that nothing really seems as if it could work. The 
belief, the faith in the international community and uh, the, that international law would be implemented has pretty much evaporated. That's one of the few avenues that people still pursue, but it, there's little hope even there. So it's it's very different. Mm. And what kind of impact does that have on your work at MEND? Does it invigorate your work more? Uh, I think it makes it harder. Yeah. It makes it, if you like, radical even just to hope, mm. to try to to encourage hope becomes a form of, of uh, action. Mm. Um, in terms of non-violence, in the 90s, there was still a, a lot of non-violence actually happening, but less awareness about its power. People in uh, the Palestinian community have used non-violence since the very beginning of the struggle, since the 1920s. There were demonstrations, there were delegations, there were... There was a major strike, one of the longest strikes, I think, in the world in 1936, led by Palestinians in resistance against uh, the British mandate and what they were doing. But um, the awareness of the power that nonviolence could have to shift the perception of the uh, Palestinians and to shift the, the dynamics of the struggle, that was never fully appreciated by the bulk of the population, although the leadership definitely appreciated it. But um, now there's much more awareness of it, mm -hmm. but uh, less potential with it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, this year, the UN has declared the theme uh, of International Day of Peace as the right to peace. Um, we're wondering how, what does that mean on the ground? Um, and do you feel that there is a big disparity between what the international community constructs um, and contributes as opposed to the reality on the ground? You know, what the international community does, it's important anyway. It matters. It leads still what goes on in, in people's minds. But on the ground, there's very little faith in anything of this kind. People have long ago given up talking about peace or, or believing that it's something that's going to come soon. Although, of course, anyone will tell you that they want peace. And people want really a normal life with a feeling of safety, feeling that they can send their children to school and be sure they'll come back, feeling that they can build a, a, a life for themselves as people do elsewhere. And this is what peace would mean. And in that case, of course, it's something that people want. But the right to it, rights are, rights are important. It's, it's good to emphasize it, I think. And ideally, it would be something that the Palestinian community would also start to work with, I think. I mean, uh, people aren't doing it at the moment because they're so... There are so many things going on that are going so badly, but it it is an opportunity, I think, that's being offered, which I hope we can take up. Absolutely. What role do you think uh, youth and women empowerment play in peace building? Is that something that MEND focuses on? It's something that we focused on from the very start as something absolutely crucial, not just because it's the future, but because it's also the present and because it's it's important to be really inclusive and youth at the moment in particular tend to be excluded and young women amongst those youth also. So from the outset, we worked with schools, for instance, working a lot uh, with schools throughout the West Bank and Jerusalem, even in Gaza long time ago when we could and um, working uh, all our projects in fact have focused on youth or women or both mm. one of our first projects was one for girls in schools called choose a future to encourage girls to stay in schools but through that we also introduced a methodology that we've worked with a great deal since called participatory video mm. where people the the participants 
are trained both to film and be filmed. They are, become aware of their own image and they also work through filming each other and themselves in discussions on different topics. So it raises a lot of awareness, including self-awareness, which then empowers them to articulate better their own views and needs. And this is one of the ways we found really effective of working with youth and women. Uh, most recently, we have been uh, doing some projects, teaching youth also to work with mobile phones, giving them media literacy, a bit of nonviolence, human rights, advocacy training, and then teaching them also how to express themselves mm. on their, uh, through their phones so they can get messages out to their peers around the world. We subtitle their films. Mm, that's brilliant. Um, how did the Nonviolent National Youth Service Project unfold? Uh, that was started in 2012, I think. Yes, now this grew out of a combination of different aspects that we had learnt and seen to be effective through a variety of projects that if you train people in nonviolence and get them engaged at the community level so that they have a real role and sense of belonging and then contribute within the community, that this can create youth leadership for nonviolence, which will then also encourage others to go in this direction. We only implemented this at a national level, in fact, once, but it went, it went so well that before the project finished, we hardly had any participants left because they'd all got jobs. We took people who were unemployed and jobless <laughs> and gave them this training and they became community leaders and uh, highly respected mm -hmm. because of the empowerment that they had gained through all of this. We had them in, in uh, training camps for three weeks, really learning, doing a lot of nonviolent role playing and mm -hmm. psychodrama, which is another thing we had found extremely effective because you, it's also a highly traumatized population. So one has to address a lot of the work with nonviolence is really addressing the internal mm. issues, the anger, the frustration, and working with people at that level. And then they take it forward to work at the community level. So this is what we were, yeah. we were doing. And then we didn't, it wasn't the right climate to get continuing funding, but we did it more also with kids just in Jerusalem mm. a few times. And that also went well. And the kids that worked on this, a lot of them stay in touch. Mm. I mean, one of the things is that by now we've done a lot of training of, of different youth and also of activists. And they, uh, they then, they, they become leaders in their own way, in their own uh, places. They're not perhaps very visible, but they, mm. they are still there. If we need trainers, they come and train. Um, at one stage, we had a real network of activists during the violence in uh, 2002. Because of the work we'd done with youth, we were getting quite well known. And uh, this was a time there were lots of suicide bombings, and a lot of battles. And some of the FATA, main political faction activists, came to ask us for help to work with nonviolence. And we managed to organize a lot of training for them. So they have actually, these leaders are still there. Most of them, they work with other things now. But they um, they built up a real network also, which stays connected with youth in their areas to, mm -hmm. to continue working with this. So, um, yes, nonviolence became almost mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. This was one of our aims. Mm -hmm. Because when I when I started, people thought I was doing something fairly ridiculous. But it seemed to me it was important and that it, it was something that people just weren't aware how much they used it. And the idea was to really mainstream it. And this was the Nonviolent Youth Service was building on that. Mm -hmm. I, at the time, 
there was a really accessible Prime Minister, Salam Fayyad. Mm. And I actually managed to speak with him about it, and he was interested. But then the whole political climate changed, and it also made it less easy to to go on. But there's a lot of people who are trained in nonviolence and who use it. There are about 20 villages that demonstrate every Friday nonviolently mm. and creatively and try to attract attention. But, of course, violence has its own battlegrounds and nonviolence also has its own battlegrounds. So you change it, you make it a nonviolent one, but part of the battle against nonviolence is simply just to make it ignored if it's not known about mm. or if it's then twisted to be perceived as violent then it becomes neutralized and ineffective so it it changes and one has to be trying to be one step ahead in how to to work with it i don't want to put you on the spot but do you have a particular person in mind that you worked with that you saw in this project that kind of exemplifies the process and the change, um, positive change? I, I, as I say, I worked with a lot of um, leading activists. And although I didn't uh, work with her directly, one of them worked, who, who lives in the north of the country, in Tulkarim, he was um, visiting uh, people who had been arrested for, for wearing suicide vests mm. and trying to convince them not to, you know, why violence was wrong. And he was very successful and he managed to get uh, one to really work as an ambassador. They went to different countries together to, to talk about why violence doesn't work. And it was very powerful because of what this girl had been about to do. So uh, at that level, yes, there are exemplars. But as individuals, no, everyone... I mean, one of the things about nonviolence also is that it's not necessarily an individual. Violence is very individual. Mm. Just needs one crazy person with a gun. Mm. But nonviolence, one of the things, again, with this uh, national nonviolence uh, uh, youth approach was to really work on the idea of team building. And we, we gave them even um, physical sort of boot camp exercise. They had to abseil down roofs and do a certain amount of adventure to really build trust and team building because support and affinity groups are essential for this. And I, I think it's, uh, again, it's a resistance against despair, this, mm. too, when you have solidarity. It's hugely helpful. Absolutely. Mm. Um, in terms of the projects, I mean, you've implemented a vast number of projects with MEND. Uh, what are the most, some of the most effective ways of working within peace building? I mean, you've touched on, on quite a few things already. Uh, you know, it's always a problem that there are limited numbers that one can reach. So I think... Probably the most effective ways, as I reflect on it, are the ways that reach more people. I mean, it's been great working with schools, for instance, and we've developed curricula so that now the curriculum, one of the curricula we developed was for school counsellors, and that got adopted by the Ministry of Education. So that's something that's in the system and can reach lots of people. Another, I think, of the more effective ways is using media in different ways, whether it's bumper stickers, which are very cheap, but also get seen. Or, for instance, we did several times, we worked with the uh, radio soap operas, which reads all sorts of people who are not the converted, who are not going to be thinking about nonviolence, but through something like, you know, a love story around a hero who changes from being violent to being nonviolent, then you can bring in also ideas around gender, around human rights, around the right to peace, if you like. I mean, it, it opens a lot of potential and people just get involved in the story and it gets ideas into the discourse. People start to discuss. So radio, I think, worked wonderfully with this. 
And again, the, the video work, the participatory video, the mobile phone projects, which are, are very much youth expressing themselves and reaching out to, uh, to other youth. Because part of the problem, again, in Palestine is it's the stereotype of uh, violent Palestinians. Mm. That comes and goes how much it's, it, it's there, but I think it still exists. And mm. I think, you know, a lot of the challenge is, is humanization. Yeah. And you humanize when you make videos mm. about human problems. We have a very short film called The Unhappy Birthday where a girl is expecting her friends to come and one by one they cancel because they can't get through the Israeli checkpoint to reach her. And this has a powerful emotional effect just because it humanizes the situation. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think is, is really the way forward to peace, to refuse the demonization which brings with it all the polarization. It it takes people out of this competition for victimhood, for mm. who is better than who, and allows people to connect as human beings, which is the way to peace. Mm. I'm I'm curious as to what you think about um, Ahed Tamimi because obviously she has become a very iconic agent of change, but she's not the first nor the last child to have been uh, subjected to imprisonment and the violations of her freedom. Um, and I saw something that, about her mother claiming, well, rightly stating that this sort of spike in interest is potentially inherently racist because of the way that she looks. And, and I'm just curious what you think, what your perspective is on that, the relatability, how people relate to... Um, yeah, the actors, the, the people who are living in the situation. Well, I think it's possible that her mother is right, that in some cases mm. there is this because she has blonde, frizzy hair, she mm. relates. But, I mean, there, and she's from a non-violent family. I, I actually taught her father in a, in a course in the university that we were giving on non-violent strategy, mm. um, Basim, mm. and her cousin who is in the film that went so viral, mm. was one of our participants in the mobile phones course. Oh. I brought you the link, I can give you the link, because she talks in her film about how after they were all arrested, mm. she had to go every week to show herself at the military governors. So there's so much that goes on, as I say, these villages mm. and a lot of other forms of nonviolent resistance, mm. lots of it. Mm. And, you know... It's it's good that it gets known about, I think, in any way. And even if there are elements of racism, I, I'm, I'm more in favour that people know and appreciate and admire this courageous girl mm -hmm. than seeing the negative side of it. Mm -hmm. I, I think the danger is that it will be tough on her to have all this attention. I think that's not fair on a, mm -hmm. on a young girl, mm -hmm. you know, that it will but that's that's a different question. But I think for the Palestinian culture, it's been amazing. I yeah. think uh, fantastic. All uh, courage and credit mm. to her and to all her family. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, for people who are attempting to make positive contributions, uh, I'm curious as to what you might recommend to organisations or individuals who want to want to make a difference i suppose what do you re what area should they focus on what's the best way from the outside to you know at the moment there are so many terrible problems in the middle east yeah. that the palestinian problem mm. doesn't necessarily seem as bad mm. as it used to seem when it was the main one but it is actually, I think, in terrible shape because I think what's happening is that it's being closed off the agenda completely. I think with President Trump's declaration about Jerusalem, taking it off the table, I think the uh, 
a stoppage of funding for refugees and this whole thing of, of questioning the numbers of refugees is a way of perhaps reducing the importance of the issue of the refugees, which is, again, absolutely a key issue. And just like Jerusalem, there can never be a solution unless there's justice mm. for refugees and unless Jerusalem is a shared, mm. open city. But these things have been somehow, well, I would say discreetly, I mean, very publicly, mm. but not so publicly that people realise the damaging long-term effect, I think, that these things are having. Because what they will do is they, they will just be, enable those who think they can get away with it to say there is no longer any Palestinian problem. Mm. And I think that's a huge danger, mm. that it is a problem. There is colossal injustice. There is no human security, no safety for Palestinians. The people in Gaza, it's it's indescribable how they have to try to cobble together their lives. It's not a life yeah. that they have there. It's not fit for any human. No one should have to live like they live there. And the whole uh, situation needs to be addressed even if it's not like Syria or Iraq or many of the other places in the region or Libya. It's a very, very long-standing injustice that ideally the international community and international law would address. I think actually one of the, the first things would be just to encourage respect for international law. I think this is what we need as a starting point mm. because that's in fact being undermined mm by what's happening. So that is a first step and then to get yeah. real justice. And then if there were justice, there would be peace. Mm. There's not a natural hostility. There's a much more natural uh, um, coexistence, peaceful coexistence in the region. Mm. Absolutely. As a member of GPAC, the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, how do you feel that they contribute to the work of MEND and also general peace building in the occupied Palestinian territories? I feel that GPAC actually really helps by, by giving a global platform for the work that we do for, well, not just this interview, of course, which uh, I'm very grateful for, but at the level, for instance, of our films, of raising awareness about the issues in, in the context of other people who really care about building peace. I feel GPAC gives a uh, tremendously important uh, platform for this and encouragement and uh, that uh, one of the difficulties with any small organization is getting one's voice out and the GPAC does this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's it for today's episode of The Peace Corner. Thank you for listening to the voices making peace possible. Tune in next time when our Nicaraguan intern Joe talks to Chale, a courageous Nicaraguan activist to understand the dire yet seldom reported situation in Nicaragua.